Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books in Economic and Business History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Brian Hamilton of Deerfield Academy, and I'm honored to be joined today by Carola Binder. She's Associate Professor and Chair of Economics at Haverford College and the author of many scholarly and public-facing articles and joins me to talk about her first book. It's called Shock Values, Prices and Inflation in American Democracy. It came out just last week from University of Chicago Press. Dr. Binder, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me, Brian. It's great to be here. At this moment, you know, 2024, it seems completely appropriate and timely for a book on the history of price stability to appear. But Mm -hmm. you began working on inflation long before it started grabbing headlines in 2021. What sparked your interest in the topic? Yeah, so um, I started grad school at twenty in 2010. Inflation was actually very low at the time. Um, if anything, it was too low. So the Fed um, in 2012 adopted a 2% inflation target, but inflation was um, stubbornly below target for most of the 20-teens. Um, so I was interested mostly in studying inflation expectations. So because um, in 2010, the the Great Recession was officially over, but for most people, it didn't really feel like the recession was over. Um, Unemployment was only falling very slowly. um, And interest rates, like the federal funds rate, which is the rate that the Fed sets, was at the zero lower bound. So they couldn't cut interest rates anymore, but they still knew that the economy needed some more stimulus, some more boost. Um, And the idea was that they could, if they could increase inflation expectations, that would reduce the real interest rate and get, um, give the economy the same kind of boost that you would get from cutting nominal interest rates. So there was a lot of emphasis at the time on like, how can the Fed, um, increase inflation expectations, or more generally, like how can the Fed affect inflation expectations? So I, I became interested in those kinds of questions and got really studying um, how people form their inflation expectations and what the role of monetary policy is and all that. Um, but yeah, I wasn't expecting that, um, you know, that we'd have this high of inflation um, again, and I wasn't really expecting that kind of relevance of my of my work. How'd you get interested in the historical perspective? Um, that really just came from um, the program at Berkeley where I did my PhD. They're one of the few places that still has an economic history requirement for everyone. Um, so I actually was a math major in college and thought I would probably do like economic theory, some of the really more math oriented microeconomics. Um, But I took a really great macroeconomic history class from um, David Romer and Christina Romer. And I I took a great, some great economic history courses from Barry Eichengreen and Brad DeLong. And it was just really interesting. And I felt like the approaches that you can use for studying history um, are are interesting and are fun. And th- there's a lot of um, questions that still needed to be answered to help with policy today. So I ended up studying macroeconomics and economic history as my as my two main fields. As we dive into the book, I, I wondered if you could first orient us to sort of the basic dynamics of inflation, sort of for, for uninitiated listeners, including myself here. Yeah, I know it affects different people differently, right? And so consumers yeah. versus producers, debtors versus creditors, and so on. Yeah. Um, so what are some of these dynamics to keep in mind? And maybe we could jump into the book by you giving us a sense of how they played out in where you began in the colonial period and in the nation's founding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the big one is like, well, inflation is um, when the overall price level is rising. So it's not about one particular thing getting relatively more expensive. It's about like the aggregate price level. Um, And most kinds of um, debts are made in nominal terms. So so if you borrow money, you promise, you know, I'll pay you back $100 next year. That's a nominal debt. It's not going to be adjusted for inflation. So if there is a lot of inflation, then the real value of your debt is less. So that would help you if you're a debtor and it would hurt you if you're the the creditor. Um, The opposite, of course, if there's deflation, if you're if there's deflation and and you're in debt, that means the real value you have to pay back is more. Um, So that's like the big 
kind of distributional effect of inflation that was really um, felt even in the very early days of the US. Um, the really kind of colorful episode is called Shays Rebellion. So during the Revolutionary War, um, there, uh, well, there was a lot of inflation, land prices especially were rising, people were um, buying land, hoping that it was going to go up in value. Um, even a lot of veterans like took out loans to buy a lot of land that they were hoping to go, you know, farm afterwards. Um, kind of on the expectation that those prices were going to keep rising and that the prices of crops were going to keep rising. Um, but there was this big post-war um, deflation. So that really um, harmed all those people who had taken out debt to buy land. And some of them, you know, were even going to debtor's prison because they couldn't pay back their loans. Um, the different state governments like took different approaches. So some state governments were willing to um, issue bills of credit, which is like paper money, right, to kind of combat that um, deflation. But in Massachusetts, um, where the state government didn't do that, um, there was this big rebellion led, led by a veteran named um, Shea, and it, it ended up, you know, requiring like um, a militia to to kind of put it down. But um, yeah, that was because all these people were in debt, and then the de deflation was really harmful for them. Um, mm -hmm. There's other like ways that inflation affects different people in different ways. Um, part of like whether or not your wages keep up or how quick, how long it takes for your wages to keep up. So if you've signed, um, just like debts are usually nominal contracts, like your, um, your job contract is a nominal contract. Like you might have a year long contract for a particular wage or salary and that's nominal. Um, and so if there's, um, inflation, then you're making like less in real terms until you get a nominal wage increase to keep up. And so different people's wages might not keep up with inflation as um, as much as others, right? And um, yeah, if, if the prices of of goods that you're selling are, are rising a lot, then you, um, you may be better off because you're earning more income, but if the prices of things that you're buying are um, increasing the most, then um, that's gonna make you worse off. So when the Constitution comes around and they meet in Philadelphia there, um, they have Daniel Shays in mind, and they also have states uh, issuing paper money and bills of credit in mind. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, coming through in the document, banks are something of a blind spot. The Constitution forbids states from printing paper money, but not from chartering banks that then go and issue mm -hmm. banknotes. Um, and it also famously doesn't expressly permit or bar Congress from creating a central bank. Um, right. And so in, in as your book moves into the early republic, and the antebellum periods, how did debates about prices get twisted up in debates about banks? Yeah, because banks, um, mostly like state banks, so banks with state charters, they would issue um, notes um, and those um, you know, would be circulating. And there was a lot of debate about to what extent were these state banks um, over issuing notes and contributing to rising prices. And that was tied in with the question about um, a national bank. So Hamilton and the Federalist, um, they were like supporters of having a national bank. And then um, Jefferson and Madison uh, were opposed to it. Um, the, the Constitution doesn't enumerate the power for Congress to um, create a national bank, but the Federalist said, well, um, well, it's necessary and proper. Um, so they relied on the necessary and proper clause. Jefferson and Madison said, you know, if you interpret the necessary and proper clause like that broadly, then the government could pretty much do whatever it wants. Um, so they they did. Um, there was the first bank of the United States. Um, it had a 20 year charter that expired in 1811. And the second bank of the national or the second bank of the U.S., also had a 20-year charter that really famously was, um, its charter renewal was vetoed by um, President Andrew Jackson in 1836. Um, so the, that Second Bank of the United States sort of played a role in kind of restraining the state um, banks. 
So when they would issue banknotes, which were supposed to be um, redeemable for specie, meaning like for gold or silver, the, the second bank of the United States would hold those state banknotes in its vault. And if it felt like um, money and credit was like growing too quickly and they wanted to slow it down, it would take those um, state um, notes and go say like, here, I, I want you to redeem these for gold or silver. And so that would limit how much um, the state banks could issue, but it didn't always work. So sometimes they just um, would suspend convertibility. The state banks um, would just say, we're not going to, um, we're not going to redeem our notes for gold or silver anymore. Um, and this all kind of came to a head in the, the panic of 1837, um, where President Van Buren and some members of Congress really blamed um, the state banks for like over issuing notes and causing a big swing in prices. And they wanted um, the treasury to just kind of cut off all relations with the state banks to not hold its deposits there anymore. That was called the independent treasury um, proposal. So, so for some parts of the antebellum period, um, this independent treasury system was in place where, um, yeah, it was based on this, um, um, yeah, desire to kind of prevent the state banks from being as easily able to contribute to price fluctuations. One theme you trace throughout your narrative is the long afterlife or even permanence of monetary policies enacted during moments of crisis. So can you mm -hmm. help us understand why this tends to happen? And if we take the Civil War as an example, which of the emergency measures that we see rolled out um, would expire after Appomattox and which ones came to constitute a new normal and why? Yeah, so in the Civil War, the big um, the big one was the Greenbacks. So the, um, the Legal Tender Act of 1862 um, authorized Congress to issue treasury notes called greenbacks. So we would, those would be paper money, right? Um, and to make them legal tender, meaning like they're required to be accepted in payment for um, debts and, and they were accepted in you know, payment for taxes. Um, but there was a big debate about whether that was um, constitutional. Again, um, again, this debate about the necessary and proper clause so the argument for the greenbacks is that they were necessary in order for um, the government to be able to provide for the common defense, which is one of its enumerated powers. Um, but then the argument against is that, well, um, well, maybe they're not necessary. Maybe the, the um, required funding could be raised by taxes or by borrowing. And also that um, you know, they're sure to be um, inflationary and, uh, is it is it like a violation of um, due process if you kind of require people to accept um, this paper money in payment of debts? Um, but yeah, because the the kind of the treasury insisted that this was like the only way to pay for the war, um, the greenbacks were um, were issued um, throughout the civil war. Um, there was still you know, after the war, they continued circulating, but they were still seen as like something that was really only um, suitable as an emergency measure and something that should um, kind of uh, be withdrawn. So the Contraction Act of 1866 was like the plan for withdrawing the greenbacks from circulation and taking this money out of circulation was um, was deflationary, which um, then was, was pretty unpopular. Like, were especially among farmers for the reasons I was explaining about um, debtors. So, um, so yeah, they, there was another like plan to kind of slow down that withdrawal to try to make it less painful. Um, but then there was like several Supreme Court cases revisiting that issue about whether um, the greenbacks were even constitutional in the first place. And the first of those cases um, was Hepburn v. Griswold in 1869. And um, that case decided that the Legal Tender Act violated due process. So it wasn't constitutional. Um, there was some turnover on the court. So like a somewhat different group of justices um, considered the issue again the next year um, in Knox versus Lee and Parker versus Davis. And those overturned Hepburn and held that um, the greenbacks were constitutional. And then later, Juilliard versus 
Greenman um, even kind of broadened that and said um, Congress was authorized to issue greenbacks even outside of wartime. So not only was it constitutional during an emergency, but it was actually constitutional not during an emergency. Um, so that, you know, now, of course, there's um, legal tender paper money. As economists and policymakers today puzzle over the causes of inflation recently, um, we saw over the past couple of years, some have named uh, you know, greedflation as one of the culprits, or I think yeah. dressed up Isabella Weber talks about seller's inflation set off by firms that are pushing price um, to juice profits or something I, I'm in my um, dumbed down version of that. Um, you show that arguments blaming firms for inflation have been made at least as far back as the progressive era. So what fed mm -hmm. this idea that sellers are responsible for inflation and how have we seen the popularity of that explanation for inflation wax and wane over time? Yeah, I mean, in the early 1900s, there um, started to be more inflation um, as there were more like, um, it was basically monetary in origin, right? There was more gold discoveries. Um, there was... Um, but it, it's kind of like the inflation, of course, consumers didn't like it. They didn't like having to pay, especially like higher food prices. Um, food prices were really rising quickly. Um, I think politicians needed like to try to find a way to deflect the blame somewhere. And they didn't want to blame farmers for high food prices. They either didn't know or didn't have a way to kind of blame um monetary expansion. So what they turned to is like, it's the middlemen that are jacking the prices up. It's it's like profiteers or price gougers. Um, so yeah, the term greedflation, it wasn't used, but like <laughs> terms like profiteers or middlemen. And there was like, you can see um, political cartoons kind of um, blaming those greedy middlemen. In the same part of, of the book, you start one of the many fascinating things your book does, which is to excavate the origin of um, both purchasing power as a metric and also the long history of the idea of inflation targeting. Um, right. And the economist Irving Fisher is your main character here. Could you sketch this out in broad strokes? People have to get the book and, and see it in more detail, but, um, sure, but how yeah. that works. Yeah, so Irving Fisher was a progressive era economist. Um, he was a pretty public figure. He you know wrote newspaper columns. Um, and he did um, some like theoretical work, basically contributing to um, how to build um, price indexes. Like today we have the consumer price index, producer price index, things like that, that we use to measure inflation. Um, but he thought that, well, once we have a good measure of price index of aggregate prices, then we also know what is the purchasing power of the dollar. Like the price index tells us the price of like a bundle of goods. So then we know we can say how many bundles of goods will, it, will a dollar buy? And he thought that that would be a good kind of target for what uh, a central bank should try to stabilize. And of course, the U.S. didn't even have a central bank when he was first kind of thinking and writing about this. Um, he wrote a really famous book about purchasing power in 1911. Um, and and this, was, this was an alternative to the gold standard. So on the gold standard, the dollar is defined um, in terms of a fixed weight of gold. And he said, no, like, let's not define the dollar this way. Let's let's um, just have the dollar be such that purchasing power is stabilized. And he thought that, um, you know, the United States needed a central bank that could have that as its goal. And the, the Federal Reserve was established in 1913 after like several years of um, study and then different um, debate. Um, so... So Fisher um, kind of almost, well, I don't know how close he came, but he <laughs> tried to get this purchasing power stabilization idea into the Federal Reserve Act. He had some influence, but not enough. It was still seen as like really radical idea because the gold standard was the orthodox way to do monetary policy. So the in the Federal Reserve Act, that kept the U.S. on the gold standard. But um Throughout the 1920s and the 1930s, Fisher supported and kind of um, testified for a lot of different bills in Congress that would have made um, stabilizing prices or stabilizing purchasing power the main goal of the Fed. Um, one of them was called the Goldsboro Bill, one was called the Strong Bill. Um, yeah, they were not 
uh, they were not successful, but um, he just kept advocating for price level stabilization. And I think that um, at least made it seem not as radical and kind of helped pave the way to eventually um, inflation targeting, which is what the Fed does now. Another major theme of the book that's also ripped from the headlines of the last few years is um, price controls. And right. you show that up up through the 19th, 19th century, it's rare for the federal government to intervene in the economy to cap or set prices. But then in the 20th century, we see repeated iterations of price controls. So what are the political preconditions for such regulations and, and what have tended to be the political effects of them? Yeah, there was some attempts at price controls during the Revolutionary War, um, but they were mostly done at like the local level. There just wasn't... Um, the like state capacity, I guess, for the federal government to do price controls, and also the the founding fathers were just really uncomfortable with price controls um, philosophically. So they were really some of them influenced by John Locke, who had written um, like a, a he had written against um, interest rate caps, which were like a, a sort of price control, and they saw price controls as um, yeah, interfering with like two people want to um, want to make an exchange at a, a particular price. And if you impose a price control, you're like forcing a seller to sell um, something at a price you didn't consent to. So it was like this John Locke idea of consent based legitimacy that they thought price controls um, were a violation of. So there was like this discomfort with price controls. And also, I think it just wouldn't have been feasible to impose them across the colonies. And then if you have a price control one place, but you can like go to the next town and there's not the price control, then they're, they're not that effective anyway. Um, but then like the civil war, for example, no real, um, no real effort to impose price controls. I think there was still the um, sense that like they hadn't worked during the revolutionary war. Um, and um I mean, there was the there was a lot of inflation, but not, um, I mean, not a devastating amount, I guess. Um, but it, it was more, yeah, during World War One and Two that price controls were much more broadly imposed. I think there was this like we're fighting this common enemy. Um, we really need to um, mobilize for the war effort. That. Um, that kind of lent more public support for the price controls. Um, there was more just of an administrative state that was capable of imposing them and enforcing them. Um, and, but yeah, but even then, like in, in World War II, they were much more like broad based than in, in World War I. Um, and so, so an interesting difference is like to compare what what happened in the Korean War a few years after World War II. Um, at that point, it was much harder to impose price controls than it had been during World War II because I think there was less um, public support for the war itself. Um, there was also a lot of memory about like the shortages and scarcities that had come from the World War II price controls. Um, there was a sense that they weren't fair because different um, lobbying groups like from different industries were pressuring Congress to, you know, make um, exceptions for their industry. And people realized that and saw it as um, as really unfair. And that kind of led to the whole thing to become um, become unfeasible. So in the, in the last third of the 20th century, and increasingly we think about um, price stability as being kind of almost solely the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Um, and you show how the Fed faced persistent questions um, through this period about not only its independence, um, but also its transparency. Um, right. in, in what ways did transparency or the lack thereof shape um, the signature fight it has in the 70s and 80s against um, the great inflation? Yeah. So in the last few decades, um, central banks have gone through what's sometimes called the, the transparency revolution because it's mm -hmm. been such a, such an extreme transition from kind of the theory and practice of central banks um, in the 70s or earlier to kind of the theory and practice in like the 90s and later. Um, there used to be this belief that like for monetary policy to be 
effective, they had to surprise the markets. Um, and so monetary policy making was like something very secretive. Um, there weren't really much um, records of what went on in the FOMC meetings. They wouldn't even announce their policy changes. Um, so there was a lot more secrecy. Um, and yeah, that was at kind of around the same time that just secrecy in government in general was being questioned, especially like during, um, well, the FOIA Act was passed, I think, around 1966 and really strengthened after Watergate when people got um, kind of fed up with how secretive the um, government was and wanting more transparency. And I think that kind of did influence um, the Fed. Uh, they were at least they became um, kind of be, began having to testify to Congress more often, um, you know, making public some of their records or at least making them public with uh, several years delay. Um, but it eventually transformed into like transparency is something that the central bank really values and thinks of as effective. Um, and that's really a cornerstone of inflation targeting, which is that like for inflation targeting, you need to convince people that you're going to keep inflation near the target. And you do that by um, being transparent about what you're doing and how you're going to get inflation to target. And so that people know sort of what your, what your goals are, what your plans are, um, and are able to then form their expectations like in line with the central bank. Um, so during the great inflation, the lack of transparency was um, partly like a lack of transparency about what the Fed's goals and plans were. People didn't know, um, like they didn't have a, a good way to like predict how the Fed would respond, um, what they were going to do to try to bring inflation down or not, what the what the ultimate goals were, and that was the big lack of. Um, Lack of transparency that was like a, a pretty big problem um now the fed still doesn't tell us like this is exactly the monetary policy rule that i'm going to follow but they do give some um ideas of at least what they're taking into consideration and they publish like projections for where they think um the fed funds rate and other macroeconomic variables might be headed they also just give a lot more um, speeches where they're explaining their decisions, even press conferences where the Fed chair will answer questions about um, from the public about like what they've been up to and what they're thinking. So. The Fed listens campaign and all that. Right. And so, which picks up on one of the core arguments of your book, which is that in your words, our approach to price stabilization is closely tied to our approach to democracy. And so I wonder, um, thinking about these kind of major crises of the last 15 years, the Great Recession and the pandemic, during which the Fed had a starring role as one of, if not the most powerful institution in, on the globe, um, what, is, what does this suggest about our approach to democracy? Um, yeah, so in some sense, like, the Fed is not a democratic institution. We don't vote on who's going to be on the Fed. We don't vote on Fed um, policy at all. And yet the Fed um, has this large and growing role in the United States and in the, the global economy and in the financial system. Um, so, you know, there's there's some room for some discomfort with that. And the Fed, I mean, obviously they know that. And that's why they really um, emphasize their accountability and their credibility and their transparency. Because if you're going to have a, an institution that is... Um, you know, in a democracy, but not democratic itself, it needs to somehow be accountable to the public. And um, the Fed actually is accountable to Congress, and then Congress is accountable to the public. So Congress um, gives the Fed its mandate for price stability and maximum employment, but then doesn't um, doesn't tell the Fed exactly what it means by those things or, or how it should go about trying to achieve those things. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, in a big crisis like the Great Recession or the pandemic, it's good that we have an institution that can like step in quickly and, and in a dramatic way. Um, it's during kind of 
more normal times that it gets a little troubling if the Fed is um, like ex trying to kind of expand its roles or when there's pressure for the Fed to expand its roles. So um, before the COVID pandemic, but after the Great Recession, there was um, a lot of talk about like, should the Fed do more about climate change or about inequality, things like that, that are not um, directly part of its mandate. You can argue that they're that they're related, but they're not directly part of it. And I think um, that those kinds of issues that are more political and that, um, you know, are um, kind of affect different groups in different ways, they're the kinds of issues that sh that we should vote on or that should be decided by elected officials. Um, the fact that people were suggesting that they be part of the domain of the Fed, I think indicates like really dissatisfaction with how our democratic processes are working and like a, a sense that um, lawmaker, if lawmakers can't get things done, then maybe we can have technocratic institutions get things done instead. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a tricky like problem for also for political scientists. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure really what the solution to that like, democratic discontent is. But I think um, at least having some constraints on where technocratic institutions like the Fed can go is important. So we want to make sure the Fed is um, is basically just limited to its mandate from Congress and that that it's clear how we can evaluate the Fed on um, on how it's achieving its mandate so that there is some sense of accountability. To make sense of some of the popular pressures you've seen on the Fed recently, you you took from political science the term techno-populism. Right. And, it, and, it, and, and, and I was um, struggling, struggling to understand. You, you talked about it, how the, this populist threat from left and right to central bankers, as you said, expanded its power. So it's kind of ironic, you would think. Usually it's trade-off, democracy or technocracy. And you're saying there's a way that they're kind of um, kind of co-created here? I don't know. You, yeah, you usually think of there being like um, the populace and the technocrats kind of being against each other, right? Yeah. Um, but there's um, some political science work showing that they're actually more related than that and that um, that both populists and technocrats are, are sort of not um, getting their legitimacy from like Democrat, the democratic process. They're both outside of that. Populists are appealing to like the, peop the people and technocrats are appealing to expertise. Um, and there's also a tendency to just combine those appeals. So um, that, you know, the Fed is, is technocratic, but um, also a lot of it, a lot of the speeches that were coming out of the Fed in the like late 2010s were kind of about trying to uh, increase its appeal to the people. Um, and there were a lot of pressures on the Fed from kind of populist groups to use its expertise to do more to help the people in whatever sense. Great. Yeah, that makes um, a lot I'm more sense. I'm not sure whether the that whole techn techno populism whether it's as applicable now, like the high inflation, I think, did kind of bring the focus of the Fed back to its core mandate. And I think, yeah, there's less um, talk about having central banks um, get into some of these other policy areas now that like um, inflation is a problem, right? When it seemed like inflation just didn't really exist anymore, then um, I think there was a lot more of the idea that like, well, why don't we just have the Fed try to um, to do more since inflation is not really a concern, but inflation is a concern now. I wonder if you could say more. You just referred to the price stabilization as the core mandate of the Fed, and it's sort of a more long-running one. But of course, since the 70s, there's been a dual mandate. And how should we think about – I mean, a lot of the things that you say – Come, the dangers and instability, democratic instabilities um, precipitated by inflation, um, eroding confidence in policymakers or, in your words, institutions, democracy itself. A lot of those things can also come from un persistent and high unemployment too, right? We can have the same kind of things. And so how do you, how do you think about the dual mandate in, in the modern era, which it got a lot of play there for a while until inflation um, jumped back up? Yeah. I mean, when I said core mandate, I did mean the both, both like the employment <laughs> right. and the price stability. Um, but the part... Um, yeah, I mean, more recently, it's like 
clearly the price stability is the part of the dual mandate that's not um not being achieved um mm -hmm. i think that um well so so a lot of inflation targeting central banks do have price stability as their primary mandate and it has some like position ahead of um that they might have some mandate to try to um promote employment but it would be secondary to price stability for the fed they are on equal footing um but there's this recognition that like if you don't have price stability then it's going to be hard to have um a strong labor market as well that you you need um maybe not in the short run but in the long run you need price stability to um sustain full employment um so yeah before before 2020 i mean inflation was so low um unemployment was pretty low but there was the thought that like well why doesn't the fed just try to get em employment um get employment even higher get unemployment even lower um just keep um keep like being as expansionary as possible because inflation doesn't seem to be a problem. And so when the Fed um, did like lift off from the zero lower bound um, after the Great Recession, there was like a lot of complaint about that because inflation itself um, was still below target and they were kind of responding to like the expectation that inflation was going to rise above target and that got the Fed a lot of criticism and I think made its way into the um, amended framework in 2020, where they they said like one is that they're they're not preemptive anymore. Like they um, they would wait until inflation actually went above target, and not just respond to the prediction that inflation was going to go above target. But they also um, they say they respond to shortfalls rather than deviations in employment. So. So there's some asymmetry there too. They're not going to worry if just because employment, just because the unemployment rate is really low, that itself is not reason for raising rates unless inflation is too high. Um, having unemployment too high is a reason to cut, but having unemployment too low isn't a reason to raise. Um, so that was like how they, they kind of changed um, the framework for how they would go about um, trying to achieve their dual mandate. Um, yeah. And that gets but, us to the, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was saying that gets us right to the conclusion of the book where you offer some proposals and some guidance for policymakers today. Um, as we peer into this uncertain future, how do you think the Fed can best strengthen both the American economy and American democracy? Um, yeah, so... In the book, I do give a like more specific suggestion, which is um, in GDP level targeting, which is instead of having a, a dual mandate um, for price stability and maximum employment, having um, instead trying to just stabilize one thing, which is the path of nominal income. Um, and this is based on some research um, showing that if they did stabilize the path of nominal income, that would also over longer run, stabilize um, inflation and um, the labor market as well. Um, now this, I'm not like, I don't think this is the only way. There was one suggestion kind of more generally. What is good about that is it, um, it provides a lot of transparency and a lot of accountability, right? We can tell, um, we know what the Fed goal is. We would know whether the Fed was a achieving that goal or not. And that kind of helps to depoliticize the Fed because it, it's not as easy to say, um, you know, to pressure for policy to be easier or tighter when they've really kind of laid out what exactly they're going to be doing. So other kinds, so yeah, and I think it's like probably pretty unlikely that that proposal will be accepted. I think inflation targeting or some variant of inflation targeting is um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to depart from that. Um, and I don't think we really need to depart from it, but I, I like for there to be a lot of transparency 
a lot of accountability and um, make it easier for people to know what kind, like how the Fed responds to um, economic conditions and just kind of um, limit it from going beyond the scope of its mandate. Um, so yeah, so those are some of my kind of thoughts about Fed policy. Thanks. I predict that a book this good is going to keep you very busy in the weeks and months to come. I'm sharing it with readers and, and talking about its ideas. Um, when the smoke clears or when your schedule allows, are there other any other projects that you're working on right now that you'd want to preview for readers, listeners? Sure. Yeah. So I don't have any other books in the works, but um, I'm working on a paper with um, two of my friends and co-authors, um, Jane Reingart and Rupal Kamdar, and it's about um, partisan views of inflation in the U.S., um, so we show that um, consumers' inflation expectations are are really polarized um, along political parties. Mm -hmm. um, so when inflation was um, rising in 2020, 21, um, the inflation expectations of Democrats stayed like totally flat, and those of Republicans um, rose like with rose with inflation, and so. Um, we show some of the implications of this for um, inflation outcomes in different areas of the country and kind of what it means for um, Fed credibility. So that's been a fun project to work on. Um, yeah, the job, a job of it should be available on my website or one of my co-authors' websites. Um, but yeah, I'll be just working a, a lot on monetary policy-related papers that's great. So everyone will keep an eye out for all of that. Uh, but for the time being, this book, this great book, again, is Shock Values, Prices and Inflation in American Democracy. It's out now from University of Chicago Press, and its author is, and my guest has been, Carola Binder. Carola, thank you so much for your time and for this book. Thank you so much.